so you need to come up with a project plan. For a pretty short project, you've decided to use the Waterfall Software Development Lifecycle. Since it's short, you've determined that the risk factors associated with the Waterfall Lifecycle are acceptable. Here's a view of what those risk factors are all about. This is what risk looks like with the Waterfall Software Development Lifecycle model. You can see that through most of the project, all the way through testing, risk remains high. And only after the successful completion of testing, particularly user acceptance testing, will risk subside. You can see by this chart that if you use an iterative SDLC, that risk will subside a bit more quickly into the project. Uh, that's why Waterfall is pretty much acceptable for a short project. But for a long project, you're probably going to break that down into iterations. And each iteration will entail an entire mini development life cycle. You will go through all the way through testing from, from um, design, development, testing, perhaps even requirements. Requirements can continue to be refined throughout the entire project. And since requirements can change, and this can have a pretty dramatic effect on the work that's being done, you want to institute a change process. So that will be another installment of the Mystery Project Management Theater. Both of these, in fact, you'll have a, an installment on the iterative SDLC, as well as change management, as well as risk management. But back to what we're focusing on in this installment, the waterfall. The waterfall is very common. It's been used forever. It's simple. It's linear. It's direct work flows in this direction and it's definitely best suited for short projects only. As mentioned, the risk is too high and the cost could be too great for using the waterfall model exclusively over a very large project. Consider a few things about the waterfall. The team starts out gathering requirements and the team that's involved in that process consists of stakeholders such as the product definition team, the customer facing team members, business analysts who are there to document every aspect of the functionality that is expected from the software. There should also be representatives from other teams. You might have your development management team there, your testing management team. But at this point, during the requirements, you still have not established the complete team. You don't have all your developers, you don't have all your testers but you do have a core set of stakeholders who are championing or creating a new product idea. But once the team moves down to design, you suddenly have a need for a different team. You no longer need your business analysts. You no longer need so much your product definition team. The product's been defined. The requirements should contain the complete definition of the product that you want to build. And the design layer is then to uh, start to really come up with the physical design of the software. What is the software we're, we're, we're going to build before we go and build it? So we have the blueprint. Now, moving from requirements to design and development, uh, I can give you some analogies. It's like filming a movie without a script. It's like taking a trip without a map. It's like cooking a new complicated meal without a recipe. It's like playing a song without knowing the music. It's like building a house without a foundation because that's what the requirements are they're the foundation of everything you're going to do from that point on everything that comes after requirements is going to point back to requirements in some way or another and there's an entire installment of project management mystery theater on requirements but something to consider about the waterfall model once we move from requirements to design for example from any level to the next level and you notice you can only move one level at a time so we complete requirements, then we move to design, then we move to development, etc., etc. And once we move forward, let's say from requirements to design, certain things come into play. So number one, as I mentioned, the team is going to change. The team dynamic needs to change. You need to make sure that you have uh, the right players in place and the right roles filled. So it's no longer so important to have a business analyst working with the business determining the functionality and the business requirements, but now we need a system analyst who can actually help to do the analysis and design. 
and we have other videos out there on analysis and design. UML is a big part of the analysis and design process, for instance. UML allows you to take your requirements and to elaborate them using pictures and using notation into a final physical design that you can hand over or that developers can use to have a very concrete idea of what they have to build. But something else happens when you move down from one level to the next and this picture should hopefully allow you to see that and, and, and that is it's easy to move from one level to the next. A lot of things have to happen when you move from one level to the next. E each of these levels, each, each, each threshold between these levels, each step itself represents a milestone. So when you move down to the next level you've passed that milestone. So in between each of these phases, in between requirements and design, there's the milestone of requirements being completed. In between design and development, there's the milestone of design completed, and so on and so forth. So we assume that requirements are completed when we move from the top level to the second level. Now we all know, anybody knows, that requirements they're never complete. You can't, you never have a guarantee that your requirements are completed because a change could come along at any point. And we're going to talk about how to manage change in another video. So even though I know that my requirements could change, I'm, you know, when I'm using the waterfall process, that one of, one of the reasons that I'm using it is because I don't expect them to change too much and I'm not using this for a long, super risky project. And if the requirements do change, I'm expecting that the change is not going to be a very expensive one. Those are all considerations to help you determine whether or not the, the waterfall life cycle is appropriate for the project. So once I move from requirements to design, the requirements are complete. They've been signed off. We've, had the, we've passed this milestone. So we've gathered all these stakeholders together and we've reviewed the requirements. Everybody agrees the requirements are thorough and done. And at this point, there is an agreement. Uh, we, we don't move forward thinking the requirements are not done. The, the waterfall is very prescriptive as far as that is concerned. Once requirements are done, then we can move to design. And then we encounter this strange aspect of the waterfall model that really makes it somewhat inflexible. So now we're down at design with the assumption that requirements are complete and we move forward. We change the team. We bring on new players. Some of the team members might move on a bit. The business analysts are no longer going to be so busy. They're not going to be building that business requirements package. The product people, again, might not be working so heavily and needing to provide so much information for the project to proceed. We've handed it over now to the system analysts in the development team because the system analysts and the developers are the ones who do the design. Which means, again, that the team dynamic is changing. The way that we're building the team is different. We have, we have a different set of players here. Uh, that, you know, we've made some important changes. And that is where the risk can really be very visible. If, if once we've moved down to design, we discover along the way that the requirements are not complete, this picture should make it somewhat clear that it is prohibitive to move back up. It's like in a video game when you, are, when you start at the top level and you jump down to the next. It, it may be that uh, once you're down at that next level, jumping back up, if you had to jump back up to the previous level, it's too high. It's costly. But whereas jumping down was very easy. You made the decision, you moved forward. When you, when you decide you have to go back, you may have to bring the team back together. This may have an impact on other projects. So using the waterfall model has that risk built in. That if you need to go back, th that the impact of that decision can be very significant and very costly.